Hello, welcome to this special two-part University of Brighton podcast in collaboration with University Alliance. I'm Richard Newman. My guests for these two podcasts are the University of Brighton's Vice Chancellor, Professor Deborah Humphreys, also the Chair of UA. And joining us as well is UA's Chief Executive Officer, Vanessa Wilson. Now, you don't need me to tell you what a strange year it's been. Students and staff across the sector have been incredibly resilient. So in this two-part special, we're going to talk about what unis have learned, what needs to change, and some of the work UA is doing to lobby government. Part one focuses much on the pandemic. Part two will look at more what needs to change going forward and the part universities will play in the UK's post-COVID recovery. Deborah, Vanessa, thanks for joining me. I think first it would be good, Vanessa, to explain what University Alliance does. So University Alliance, uh, we're one of the um, mission groups, lobby groups, representative groups um, within the higher education sector. Uh, so there's a few, few groups uh, out there that either um, represent uh, or lobby on behalf of um, different types of universities. And so University Alliance, we represent uh, professional and technical universities. So we are the voice, or we like to consider ourselves the voice of those universities. Mm -hmm. And look, it's been a really difficult year now. God, it sounds mad to think that we're saying we're coming up to a whole year since we all left campus um, and I guess these universities have really had to work together during this pandemic. Um, I've spoken to uh, Deborah, our Vice Chancellor, who's joined us on this podcast uh, just before this and Deborah, I really wanted you to sort of broaden out what you said about how one of your colleagues has sort of said that you've got to come together as competi mates. Yeah, Richard, thank you. Um, I, I, the one, th one of the things that's been an extraordinary value in this period, in this last extraordinary year, since the 23rd of March, and actually early February, when we started preparing for the pandemic, um, has been being a member of the Universities Alliance. And it's not just for me to be able to meet regularly. And, and Vanessa has convened, at one stage, we were convening weekly meetings with all the vice chancellors. And we're all sharing extraordinary challenges and, and, and responding in different ways. And it's been, you know, those moments when you think, I'm not sure how I can see my way through this. Then great, um, great colleagues, great ideas, great support. And we've all supported each other in many ways. The other really fantastic thing that Vanessa and the team at the UA have done is bring together networks of colleagues from across the institution. So directors of finance, directors of human resources, PVC's education, PVC's research, um, registrars and secretaries. And I think everybody who's engaged in those has found that um, really, really valuable. And whilst we are competitors in higher education in many senses, that drive to collaborate, which, which is what you see all across higher education, that drive to work together as respectful peers has absolutely come through those network meetings. And Vanessa, I guess for you, um, that's, that must be the difficult bit, really. It's that balance of trying to find all the universities to, to come together when, yeah, I guess they are all at competition with each other. But a situation like this must really have brought together people as much more stronger as a collective. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think we will always look at the COVID pandemic as a watershed moment for, for so many, for so many reasons. Um, and I think this for University Alliance was the moment where everybody came together, um, comrades in arms in this extraordinarily challenging environment and situation. And as Deborah explained, you know, bringing people together on a regular basis um, through technology, um, uh, and I'm sure we'll talk about what te technology has enabled us to do. And often I would chair those meetings of of uh, human resources directors, finance, um, you know, heads of art schools, te the teacher, people responsible for teacher training. I mean, I should say we started off before the pandemic with um, eight networks, so academic networks, uh, and our and our VCs would meet formally three times a year, uh, and we've gone from eight networks to thirty-two. Uh, I mean, we literally have cut right across and through um, our members and bringing those people together, and they will 
it pretty much without fail say to me, it's just so great to have that safe space where I know I'm not the only one going through this. Um, and I can sort of have a moment where I say, is anyone dealing with this problem? And, you know, five, six people will sort of put their virtual hand up and say, yes, I am dealing with this. And I have, a, I've worked out how to get through it. And, and actually the competitive nature that we kind of leave that at the door. Um, and it's right, you know, we'd have to respect that people, the universities are in competition, but it is left at the door. Um, and that's really, um, you know, testament to the professional people that are working across our members. So it, it's been extraordinary. And now our VCs, as Deborah said, they meet, they meet pretty much with minimally every two weeks. Uh, but it was at one point twice a week, right at the beginning of the pandemic, because it was such a rapidly evolving picture. And as you know, you know, once the call came out about national lockdown, that was it, you know, having to go from face to face to physical face to face, because I know that virtual is, you know, there is, people are seeing each other, but um, to, to, you know, digital learning um, overnight, literally overnight, and that ma mammoth effort. Um, so, and I think a testament to bringing people together mm. in that safe space um, to share ideas. Mm. We're going to talk in detail about what needs to happen for universities to succeed going forward what needs to happen with the government. We're going to look at that a little bit later on. But yeah, I just want to touch on basically what you were just talking about there, Vanessa, in terms of how we've had to really embrace technology to make um, working life work and, you know, in, most importantly, create a, the right kind of experience with the best possible experience for our students as possible. Um, and, uh, and, and, and Deborah, just, I mean, having had to oversee all of this, from the University of Brighton's point of view, I mean, how tough has that been? Because it's not, it's not a simple situation where you can just, just say to students, right, okay, uh, here's uh, Microsoft Teams, um, go. Um, well, I mean, Richard, it's um, the only way we've been able to do it. I mean, yes, the technology is an enabling tool, but the only way we've been able to do it is through the, the resilience, the creativity, the energy of every member of staff and students. I mean, students, for many students, this isn't the environment they want. I think I always go back and think about our fine art painters who hopefully now the roadmap's been announced are, are I hope, leaping with joy and looking forward to getting back into the studio in a socially distanced way with face coverings, obviously. But in terms of the technology, it's, you know, I, I can remember having my first coaching session on using Teams, which was sort of about two days before I was doing a lecture in the School of Health Sciences, thinking, oh my God, I know how to share a video and what, how do I, what happens if people don't turn their cameras on and all that sort of stuff. And, um, and you sort of do it and you sort of apologise all the way through, but we got through the lecture and people asked questions and that was fine. And that seems like an age ago. And if I were doing it now, you know, just the fact that we've got used to using the technology and the, the creativity you can bring to it. And I am really mindful of colleagues across the institution. I think some of the geographers have been amazing in how they've used digital resources and assets to change the, the, the whole learning experience. And, and for me, what's really important is the really important thing is what we learn from all of this. And what we take forward i mean in, in terms of how we deliver education and what does working and learning in a university look like in the future and you know for example the ua at the university's alliance we used to spend ages trying to find a date when we could get all the vice chancellors together in the same physical space i mean literally could spend a month trying to find that date well we're never doing that again so it's just the level of communication and connection is just it's changed exponentially mm. What about in terms of the students and how they've had to cope with this as well? Um, because um, we, we spoke before we came onto this podcast, Deborah, about digital poverty and the support the unis have given um, because it isn't as simple as that everyone is well set up to be able to, to cope with this situation. And also aside from that, um, 
you know, having the right spaces to be able to study in the right environments. And I also wonder as well, just, you know, throwing that out to you as well, Vanessa, when we get to that in just a moment, how universities have collaborated on that so they can share the best practices to be able to find the right solutions so that it works for everyone. Because ultimately, every university has the same goal to create the best possible experience for their students. Um, Richard, I think you, I mean, absolutely. I think what this has revealed is, for a so-called knowledge economy, the level of digital poverty and exclusion, digital exclusion in our society, when you suddenly make everybody dependent on that technology has been, I think, shocking. Um, not, I mean, just it's, if you just look at schools, the assumption that every child is sitting at home with a laptop and, and, and internet access is just you know, patently and painfully wrong. Um, and our own students, so we immediately launched a digital poverty, um, a digital um, infrastructure fundraiser. We deployed every single laptop and laptop loan that we had out to students, dongles, we bought new kit, we bought dongles. Because I'm always, I always remind people, just because somebody's walking around with a mobile phone and can text, you know, with a single finger and heaven knows what else, it does not mean that they've got the capacity, the capability in terms of the technology and a space in which to do meaningful learning. The software that we, that students require. So some of the really specialist software that, you know, the mathematicians or the engineers or uh, the social scientists need is just not on a laptop. Um, so the, I think we, that, that again, for me, makes us have to think, so what, what does our digital infrastructure look like going forward? What do we what do we need students to what what expectations should we have what what's what's in the package about the expectations and, and the capacity and kit that you need to learn because we'll undoubtedly use this technology just as much i mean vanessa you've been i mean across our we, we did a piece of work at the ua to look at i mean at brighton we've we invested over half a million pounds in buying kit for students and distributed it I've no expectation that kid's going to come back. I mean, somebody's going to shoot me for saying that, but I, you know, it's investing in our students. Um, but we did a piece of work across the UA to actually ask that question about yeah. how are we all investing. I mean, so, Vanessa, oh, it's you million. Yeah, yeah, it's million. It's millions, and and that was another example of where we were able to bring networks. So we brought IT leads together. Um, the cyber security, lead, you know, there's a subgroup <laughs> because of clearly when you go into the te technical space, technological space, uh, the cyber issues have been massive uh, and there have been some quite horrifying potential threats um, to digital infrastructure in the universities. So, yes, uh, and everything that Deborah described in terms of what can we do to support our students who don't come from privileged backgrounds. Um, in some cases, we've got members who do give out equipment um, traditionally to their first year students, uh, and that, that is part of the offer um, and the support. Um, but, but you've touched on, I think, a really important um, political issue really, which is around digital poverty. Um, and uh, we're just not set up, the, the investment isn't there, the infrastructure isn't there. And it's one of the great social dividers and it's something I feel kind of quite strongly about. And I've heard some horrifying stories from just from even um, from sort of primary, you know, we're all in this situation and uh, it, it really will divide and create that massive gap in terms of um, uh, learning capability. You know, people are living in multi-generational households and if you're all trying to do the same thing, that you haven't got access to space. Um, this is where the, the gulf between the haves and the haves not just grows bigger uh, and that's where government really needs to to step in and uh, and we'll probably go on to it but in terms of um, you know I'm, I have a fortunate position to sit on the Ministerial Higher Education Task Force uh, as, as, a, as a representing UA and my members I think the one area where um, perhaps thing, a lot more could have been done is around the digital inclusion space to do more to support students and um, there has been quite a bit of investment um, I suppose people would say it's enough for, for pupils in primary and secondary, but not not for higher education, which I think is um, um, it, it needs to be really looked at. Yeah. But with the voice that you, with the voice that you've got on the task force, which I, I don't suspect I don't expect the task force is going to be wound up anytime soon. 
is we, you know, what I worry about the fact that people will rush to get back to the way life used to be thinking um, and we don't learn the lessons we don't we, we we can forget very quickly if we choose to do so and we can't forget about this we can't forget about you know the the strain and the burden on staff and on students the challenges for students i mean we've opened up all our learning spaces for students who've got nowhere they have nowhere to study yeah. um and i just i just worry if we don't keep strongly influencing at a political level that some of this will be conveniently forgotten while policies and politics move on to other agendas. Yeah, and um, one of the really good things to come out is um, Sir Michael Barber, who, as you know, is the outgoing chair of Office for Students. He, he has done a, a review into uh, the digital teaching and learning and what we've learnt from, from operating in this. And, his his report is due out imminently um and you know he had you know we invited him to meet with our pvcs of teaching and learning and that was a really fantastic session and he got to really get under and understand how we did because actually you know we have been i suppose vanguards in this space anyway because we've often taken a digital first approach so the transition was quite was pretty good for our for us as our, for our students. I mean, not perfect, and a lot a lot of challenges along the way. But we probably got there in a quicker quicker time than some other potential types of universities. So I was really pleased that um, PVC for teaching learning at Teesside University, Mark Simpson, was invited um, on his panel session and to to be more closely involved in that work. So I do think you know that that review will hopefully you know government will take notice and understand how important it is to get this to get this right because as Deborah as you say Deborah um we shouldn't go back to how things were because this has there's been a huge amount of opportunity from from this way of working you know uh, in terms of you know listening into that session the, the PVCs of teaching learning have said you know there are certain groups um who I, I like to describe as life challenge you know we've all got challenges in our life and we're all balancing but for those for people who have a lot of life challenge whether or not they are they're mature students they're parent students they you know they're carers they you know they're commuter students digital teaching and learning has really opened up um opportunities for them uh to be able to learn when they want to um and you know how amazing that you can kind of hit the rewind button if you've missed something or go back or you can do it on your time um so it is it is huge and some of our vice chancellors are even thinking about i don't need a lecture hall anymore they're li literally redesigning their campuses because why why would you, that's a massive amount of space and it could be put to new and better uses um because of what technology has enabled mm, absolutely that I mean, been, sorry sorry deborah now, I think it's unavoidable. It, it's absolutely right that we think about, we, we did a, at the University of Brighton, we did a COVID check-in survey with staff in um, August and September. Um, and, and we'll do another one as well. And the really strong message that came through from colleagues um, was that, you know, we've got, we were in lockdown two. So that was, we got beyond the adrenaline of lockdown one. We've got into the lockdown two before we hit the, oh, I've had enough. And haven't we all of lockdown three? Um, but in lockdown two, when we asked people, a lot of people saying, actually, I, you know, we 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 use technology very little for for meetings such as this um, before. And suddenly, people were going, actually, no, this is fine. Um, actually, I quite like this. I like the flexibility. You know, it's not for everybody. There's a distribution curve in this, as there is in all things in life. But um, and every week since the 23rd of March last year, I have called staff on a one-to-one -one basis all across the university. And conversations I've had with people who said, do you know, I can do my job perfectly well sitting here at my kitchen table and I'm quite happy to do it. Um, and I'm not spending time commuting. I mean, I'm heating the house, but I've also got more time with my kids. Some people actually said they were getting more sleep, which, which I think is probably a helpful thing. It's not for everybody. There has to be a mix in this, but I don't think that the presenteeism model that we had before, where everybody just has to turn up for the sake of turning up, when you can do your job just as well in another location, um, is, I mean, we've got to look at that and think about how we use our space and place. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's about valuing the, sorry. No, sorry. It's about valuing, 
the time together you know we we at university alliance we had an office space we we dispensed with that quite early on actually uh and we've gone uh to having a touchdown space so i i really never want to return to that model of a sort of eight till six commuting uh to then sit in an environment where we're sort of hunkered down on our laptops etc i want that to be time when we're together to do the kind of to, you know the creative thinking the the strategy sessions you know we can all take our laptops and, and work, do the close work at home you don't need to commute for for three hours um uh, to, to do that uh, if you think about the time lost and the environmental impacts and 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 everything else and as you say what you're missing out on um, but when we do come together we've all missed that when you come together and those added benefits um you know the events that we've missed out on it's, it's not necessarily the event it's the networking the, the, the sort of things around the edges um the collaboration the ideas that's difficult there, to do there are people there are colleagues at, at brighton who um i mean as with many all the universities across the ua so our caretakers and cleaners and actually in our case our payroll team in a phased way have remained on campus all the way through you know on the days when i've gone in I'm still waving and saying hello to the caretakers and the cleaners who have been absolutely stoic and wonderful in terms of keeping it safe, keeping it clean, keeping it COVID safe for everybody. And um, we've got a little catering outlet that does take away and it's the same team there, always going buy a coffee. But, you know, and I think that, you know, for the balance in this, there's, there's still lots of us who can't wait to get back to being able to meet with people um, other than our own household. <laughs> <laughs> um, in, in time to come up for students. I mean, university is a profoundly social experience. So I, I could almost, when, when the roadmap was announced um, and the return for, and, and Vanessa and through the UA, we've done a huge amount of lobbying behind the scenes for months pre-Christmas, mm -hmm. thinking about mm -hmm. the return. So the outcome that was in the, um, the roadmap this week was, was um, on the optimistic end of what was being suggested at some stages so the fact that all of our students who need specialist facilities and laboratories and studios and workshops can come back because at one stage it was only going to be final year but now it's all of them which is i could almost i could almost hear the school of art and media cheering when that announcement came out because you know our fashion our painters you know all across the ua those students who desperately need the facilities that you only get at university were hopefully going yes roll on the 8th of march before we move on from that i just want to quickly touch on um and, and we talk about the roadmap and and universities going forward i just want to touch on um attainment really because uh universities are making some doing some fantastic work pre-lockdown and i just wonder what the two of you have seen in terms of how that might have not taken a step back but taken sorry taken a hit because of the access to university. Uh, do you, have you seen changes? I was just interested to know whether that work has been impacted by the pandemic. I mean, just let me do the attainment, the, the one that really, I get really exercised about and focused on. I know um, Provost Chancellors all across education, all across the UA, and certainly ours at Brighton, Ruth, has, is working incredibly hard on, is the, uh, the attainment gap for students of, um, Latin and ethnic minority backgrounds. And our attainment gap has reduced during this time, which leads you to question, so what is it that's done that? Is it, is it assessment? Because we've changed assessment. Um, is it delivery? What is it? So there's a whole set of really important questions we need to explore about, um, so how has this impact, how has this experience changed? Why is it that this experience has changed the attainment gap? And what of it do we keep to make sure that we continue to to work to reduce that attainment gap? I probably uh, this is this is quite um, an expert drilling down. I mean, I would totally agree with with what Deborah said. I mean, I, I from the conversations that I I, I listened into, uh, it, it I mean, it's probably early days for for, for me to get a kind of right across the the UA picture, but I certainly get a sense that. This way of work, sort of learning, um, has been a complete enabler, and that those kind of right across the piece uh, has enabled those that perhaps 
struggled or were challenged for various reasons um to to yeah it, it's it's been such an opportunity for them i think you know it, it will be really interesting to look back and do a piece of what a study in terms of understanding what it what as, aspects about it um, i mean it's certainly Given your role at the task force, mm. you know, if we've got the evidence, which I suspect across the UA we will have the evidence, it won't be just from Brighton, it'll be from all our members. I mean, it is, a, it is an issue we need to find an appropriate way to flag with ministers. Yeah, I mean, I don't know what, I, I mean, it, it's really interesting to understand what, what would have, what was it that's, that's enabled that, the gap uh, to close? And I think, you know, uh talking about it here and now it, it is worth really looking at what we have collectively learned from that because this is incredibly positive as you say deborah we've been grappling with this uh for for years uh, and uh, and if this watershed moment and this way of learning um has has helped to reduce that what what is it you know why uh, and what what do we have to keep doing more of because if we we need to banish it completely the, the gap so yeah I think it's 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 a really interesting um area to, to to talk about um and to raise ministerial because there's you know obviously there's lots of lessons to be learned right across the education piece um so yeah I mean the other the other the other attainment issue of course that we we grappled with through all of this was um exam results last summer <laughs> last summer, yeah, it was twenty. Yeah, last summer. I forget which year I'm in now. <laughs> you know, and the uh, the slight debacle in terms of we're all lined up for something, and then and it all changed very rapidly. So that that was, you know, again to the uh, recruitment and admissions teams across the whole of the UA, and certainly to the, the fabulous team at Brighton. It's been you know tripping the light, fantastic on a on a, a regular basis. So at least now we know that teachers are going to be trusted to grade their students for this year's results. Well, that's 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 an interesting one, isn't it? Is whether or not you know are exams uh, the best assessment of mm. the pupils' potential? I mean, that was something that you know uh, I did raise directly with the Secretary of State, who joined one of our task force meetings. But um, at the time, and they seemed pretty wedded to exams. Um, I think we could have all. What's quite frustrating is that we last summer all kind of uh, knew in our hearts it wasn't going to work out. It, uh, and so when the, the debacle happened uh, and new turns, et cetera, a lot of that could have been avoided. I think a, you know, a lot of lessons have been learned because uh, the task force came into being predominantly for that kind of dealing with the debacle and it stayed in place. Uh, and to her credit, the minister, university minister has found it extreme, an extremely useful forum to be able to um, work with the sector uh, in a in an inconfidence way uh, and, and you know there we can say what we want she does listen and she does you know take take yeah. she doesn't always do the things that we want her to do but you know <laughs> she listens <laughs> and she has those conversations i mean i think one of the most critical points was you know obviously uh, in terms of applications our, our healthcare courses particularly nursing were massively oversubscribed and the minister was you know wanting to get these these nursing prospective nursing students placed this was a great opportunity to sort of thump the table which i did uh, virtually to say it's not you know we've got a problem here let placements are the limiting factor we can't take these students on unless there's more placements and she to her credit you know she 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 got the right people in the room and 15 million was found uh, to unlock more placements so you know it has been and that, and i mean that's that's been a continuing conversation. I mean, we had a UA meeting only this week um, with um, Health Education England, a really helpful, you know, on the same emphasis that we always put that as a mission group, we're a group of universities who are absolutely focused on being um, solution focused. You know, we're collaborative. Yes, we're competitive. We're universities, we're in that space. But the power of collaboration and the power of um, positive ideas we're not there to whinge and moan we're there to say actually we could do this for you you know we could double the number of mental health nurses um all of the things that we know the nation needs you know it transcends politics it's about the care workforce the caring and professional workforce that we need for the future teachers nurses physios ot's social workers medics you know radiographers i shall get into deep trouble because i've forgotten somebody 
Um, but it is that it's that public service workforce that we all we play a really important role in in developing. Thank you both for your time. We're going to leave it there for part one. Part two will be available sometime this week, but it's good to break this up into smaller chunks, I think. So look out for that. Subscribe via all the usual podcast platforms. Search University of Brighton wherever you get your pods or on our YouTube channel. Thanks for listening.